Jim, let's start at the beginning. It's November 1860. The Republicans have won the election. Lincoln is president-elect. Who's Jefferson Davis in the fall of 1860? Jefferson Davis in the fall of 1860 is a senator from Mississippi. He has served in that capacity off and on for about eight years, interrupted in the middle 1850s by four years as Secretary of War under President Franklin Pierce. He was one of the most prominent of the Southern senators. He was not a fire-eating secessionist, but he did believe in the right of the South to secede. But because he had a strong affinity for the Union, uh, for which he had fought in the Mexican War. Uh, he was a graduate of West Point, class of 1828. He uh, was put on a committee of 13, a Senate committee of 13, to try to find some way out of the crisis precipitated by the response of the Deep South states, starting with South Carolina, to Lincoln's election. South Carolina immediately called a convention to consider seceding from the Union, and everybody expected that they would pass it. So when Congress met in December of 1860, uh, Davis was put on this committee, uh, and I think he hoped at first that it might be possible to find some kind of solution to the burgeoning crisis of, of disunion. So Davis was really not a hothead. He was a man of reason. He was not fanning the flames of war. He didn't fantasize about leading armies in the field or becoming president of the Confederacy. He would have preferred that secession not have happened. I think that's right. Uh, at times during the 1850s, uh, at the time of the crisis over the admission of California and the proposal for what became the Compromise of 1850, he sometimes talked like a fire eater. Uh, he sometimes said uh, that if the North does not grant us our rights, and by the rights they meant the right to take their slaves into the territories, the right to recapture escaped fugitive slaves in the North, uh, maybe we should set up for ourselves. But for the most part, he was, he was known as a reasonable Southern nationalist, but also an American nationalist. Mm -hmm. And Davis liked the North. He traveled widely in the North. He had Northern friends. He gave talks in the North. At one point in his career, he said, with your great industry and our great agriculture, we'll conquer the rest of the continent. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, in 1859, he had taken a summer trip to New England, uh, where he had given a number of speeches, uh, praised New Englanders. Uh, actually, when he got back to Mississippi after, after that, uh, that trip, he was uh, uh, criticized by a lot of other politicians and newspaper editors in Mississippi for kowtowing to the North. And you're quite right, he did have quite a few friends. Actually, the uh, uh, man that everybody expected to be the Republican candidate for president, William H. Seward, was a close friend of Davis's uh, until, of course, the split came, and other Northern senators as well. So how did a man like this, a man who liked the North, who fought for the United States, who held the cabinet position, was in the Congress, was in the Senate, was not an avid secessionist. How did this man end up as the president of the Confederate States of America? Well, once the state of Mississippi seceded, and once it became clear to Davis that no compromise that would be acceptable to the South was going to emerge from this committee of 13 or from the Congress itself, uh, he threw in his lot with the Confederacy. He resigned from the United States Senate, um, giving a final speech in which he said that he did so with regret. People in the audience were reduced to tears that's, in the gallery. That's exactly right. They were reduced to tears. Uh, and went back to Mississippi uh, and was immediately named as the uh, general in chief of the Mississippi State Militia. At this stage of the secession process, there was no Confederate States of America yet. There were uh, six and about to be seven uh, states that had seceded from the United States. Uh, and it was clear that these states uh, would be facing uh, potential military conflict if the United States Army moved in and tried to quote unquote coerce them to stay in the Union. So he was named as the General in Chief of Mississippi Militia and began organizing uh, the Mississippi Militia. Uh, and, and 
looked forward with regret, uh, but realism to the possibility that there would in fact be uh, military conflict. And while he, then he went home to his uh, pan, uh, plantation at Davis Bend in, uh, along the Mississippi River, where he uh, owned 113 slaves. He was a large slave owner. And while he and his wife, Irina, were making rose cuttings on the uh, morning of February 10th, I think it was February 10th, 1861, uh, a messenger came with a telegram. The telegram was from Montgomery, Alabama, where a convention of delegates from the uh, six and soon to be seven seceded states were meeting. Uh, and the telegram informed him that he had been named provisional president of the Confederate States of America. And I think there were two basic reasons why they named him as president. One, that he, he was known as a moderate and not as a uh, fire eater. And the Confederacy was trying to present to the world and especially to the eight slave states that had not yet seceded, and for that matter, even to the Union states, an image of reasonableness, of moderation. And second, his military experience. He was a graduate of West Point. He had served uh, seven years in the regular army. He had commanded the Mississippi Volunteer Regiment quite uh, courageously and effectively in the Mexican War. Wounded in battle? Yes, uh, came home as a wounded war hero uh, and had served as chairman of the Senate Committee on, the military, on Military Affairs and as Secretary of War. So there was probably no man in the South who was better qualified both in terms of his political experience, but especially his military training and experience to lead this new nation, which uh, its founders anticipated might have to fight for its existence. He was possibly also the best qualified man in the South to know the challenge that lay ahead. He knew about the railroads, the ships, the northern industry, the guns, the cannon, the firearms. He knew every disadvantage that the South was going to face, didn't he? He was very much a realist. Uh, he had traveled all over the country. Uh, he knew he could read the census returns. Uh, he knew that the, uh, while the South uh, produced cotton and other staple crops and uh, had a majority of the exports uh, and earned most of the foreign exchange in the American economy, it was an overwhelmingly rural and agricultural society. And, if war did come, it would be confronting a much more modern, diversified uh, economy. So he was well aware of the challenges. And when other, once the war began, when uh, many other Southerners expected a short and victorious war. A he march to Washington yes, and conquest. Right. He, he, he warned them uh, that this was likely to be a long and very difficult contest and that they should uh, they should recognize that it was not going to be a, 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 an easy task at all. Well, he did have some advantages. What were some of the advantages that the South began with? Let's start with the territory, 750,000 square miles, a huge agricultural empire, and the Union wasn't there, except for a few forts. There were no Union troops in the South. Yeah, that is a, that's exactly right, and uh, that's something that a lot of people don't really um, appreciate because it's so obvious that it escapes attention. That is, unlike most rebellious or revolutionary movements, the Confederate States of America began life in complete political and military control of nearly all of the territory that they claimed to control. They did not have to fight to gain control of uh, the territory, of the resources uh, of the political institutions, they already had it. So basically the Confederacy could win the war merely by surviving. Uh, that's a huge advantage because it takes a lot more to invade and conquer than it does to uh, defend and survive. Uh, a lot of, uh, another uh, uh, advantage or at least uh, uh, another quality that the Confederate States had was potentially strong military leadership. Uh, not only Davis himself, but a large number of uh, fairly prominent Army officers, and graduates of West Point, made the commitment to join the Confederacy. Their names, uh, once, once Virginia joined the Confederacy, their names are very well known, Robert E. Lee, Joseph E. Johnston, 